Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Imam Hussein TV3. Imam Hussein Charity is giving you the chance to provide food baskets for destitute and impoverished families all over Iraq and Afghanistan. Each basket costs around £30, $35 roughly, and can feed a family of four. The food basket contains essentials such as flour, bread, tomato puree, oil. Um, they get different spices as well, salt, pepper, um, even you know, like cinnamon. You get lentils, you get different vegetables, uh, meats, dates, tea, dried lemons, and not forgetting rice. Take advantage of this blessed month and help destitute and impoverished families. You can pay via bank transfer, PayPal, or visit us at www.imamusincharity.com. Give the gift of a healthy meal to a family in need by donating to our Food Basket campaign. In the name of God, the most beneficent, the most merciful. All praise is due to Allah, Lord of all the worlds. And peace and blessings be on all his prophets, and especially the final prophet, the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. My respected brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. We continue in our series of discussions by looking at another controversial area, an area in which a number of the Shia community continuously gets accusations or is slandered because of, and that is the wives of the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. And especially an analysis of the conspiracy of Aisha and Hafsa against the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, as mentioned in the Quran and within Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, as well as the works of Tafsir. Remember, ultimately, our aims within these discussions are for us to understand each other's literature. When I open up, for example, Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, it is so that I could also be fair in relation to those who I am discussing, other schools in Islam and their literature, and not just base it on hearsay. But at the same time, what I've decided today is not only to bring the books of Hadith, but also to bring the tafasir of the Holy Qur'an. Because we know very well that there are a number of incidents that occur in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, which are mentioned only in hadith. But there are certain incidents which are mentioned within the Holy Quran as well. And one of the main incidents that's mentioned within the Holy Quran is the incident where Aisha and Hafsa, the two wives of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, conspire with one another against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, because of a jealousy that exists between them and other wives of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. I'd like us to play this clip of the respected Nu'man Ali Khan as he makes clear how this discussion unfolds within Surah 66 of the Quran, Surah Tahrim. Please play the first clip. There's cooperation. So if you two get together and you want to gang up on him, you know, why did you... You know, why are you being so harsh against us? Why we can't we can't talk anymore? We're good friends, and they were really close to each other too. You know, Habsa and Aisha, Allah Taala, very very close. When Tadahara Alihi, if you both gang up against him, you 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 know uh, uh, strong arm him. For in Allah Hu Amaulahu, and no doubt Allah He is His protective friend. Notice here how Nu'man Ali Khan uses the words gang up against the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. Cooperate against the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. These words, and he admits that this refers to Aisha and Hafsa. First and foremost, let's look at the Surah and the Quran, which discusses this particular conspiracy. And then let's open up so that we see what is it that the books 
mention in relation to the tafsir of these verses. Let us all go here. Surah 66 of the Holy Quran. All of you could see. Surah Al-Tahrim. Surah 66 of the Holy Quran translated in the English language as the prohibition revealed in Medina. 12 verses in two sections. Section number one, warning to the Prophet's wives. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayyuhan nabiyu, lima tuharrimu ma ahalla Allahu lak. O Prophet, why do you forbid unto yourself what God has made lawful unto you? Tabtaghi, mardatu azwajik, do you seek to please your wives? Wallahu ghafoorun rahim, God is the most forgiving, the most merciful. It's a very interesting beginning to this surah because naturally I would want to ask the question, what's happening over here? We have a very interesting situation at the beginning of Surah 66 of the Holy Quran. God is openly discussing, publicly discussing, the personal life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Sometimes, if the Shia discuss Aisha or discuss Hafsa, or for that matter, any of the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, you'll see that straight away people will say, how dare you discuss the lives of the wives of the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. The reality is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within the Quran, discusses how A, the companions blatantly discuss the personal life and the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. You all know the incident of the ifk and how some companions even went as far as slandering Aisha, but we'll leave their slander of the wife of the Prophet. That keeps them in the religion of Islam. No one can say a word. We'll leave that on the side. But on this incident, what's interesting is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala openly discusses what is happening in the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. If we come back to the verse in question, verse number one, God is telling him, why do you forbid unto yourself what God has made lawful unto you? So there's something which is lawful for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi to do, which the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, is making unlawful for himself. This is very interesting because the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, has something which is permissible for him but all of a sudden, he's decided not to do that, which is permissible for him. And at the same time, God actually tells him, do you seek to please your wives? That means there is something that's happened where the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, seeks to please his wives, which normally is the most meritorious thing that you would do and something that he's proud of, that he is the best to his family and that we should be the best to our families. But here God says to him, you seek to please your wives? Why? God is the most forgiving, the most merciful. Now, when I see a verse like this, I ask myself the question, what is happening over here? What makes this issue more controversial and what makes this conspiracy even clearer is if we continue to verse number three. When you continue to verse number three, what does it say? وَإِذْ أَسَرَّ النَّبِيُّ إِلَىٰ بَعْضِ أَزْوَاجِهِ حَدِيثًا فَلَمَّا نَبَّأَتْ بِهِ وَأَظْهَرَهُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ عَرَّفَ بَعْضَهُ وَأَعْرَضَ عَنْ بَعْضَهُ فَلَمَّا نَبَّأَهَا بِهِ قَالَتْ مَنْ أَنْبَأَكَ هَذَا قَالَ نَبَّأَنِيَ الْعَلِيمُ الْخَبِيرُ Look at what it says. When the Prophet confided unto one of his wives a matter, she divulged it unto others. God apprised him thereof. He made known a part of it and avoided a part. So when he informed her of it, she said, who informed you of this? He said, inform me, the all-knowing, the all-aware. So the Prophet has confided a secret to one of his wives, my dear brothers and sisters. He has told a secret to one of his wives. And what happens is that God tells him about this secret. When the Quran says, When she went and told her friend, Allah revealed to him a part of this secret and did what? Avoided another part. The Holy Prophet then in recognizing that there is a conspiracy between two of his wives where one wife has confided or revealed a secret piece of news to another, the Prophet tells her, she replies, very interestingly, and I'm going to come back to this very shortly. She replies, who told you? 
That's one of the most interesting lines I've ever read in the Quran. I'll come back to that very shortly. And he replies, inform me the all knowing, the all aware. If we continue to verse number four, at the moment, all that we are doing is we're just reading the apparent meaning of the Quran. That's why those people who say we don't need hadith, Quran is enough for us. I ask them, what's these verses about? If the Quran is enough for us and we don't need, need hadith, the Prophet has been told by God, why do you forbid for yourself what I've made lawful for you? The Prophet tells his wife a secret. She goes and tells someone else. The Prophet is told by God, which wife, what happened? The Quran doesn't reveal everything. I need to go slowly to Bukhari and Muslim. And I need to go to the works of Tafasir. And I'll open up all the works of Tafasir because they're all in full agreement about this conspiracy taking place. Let's go to verse number four. Look how damning verse number four is. In tatuba ilallahi faqat sagat kulubukuma. Wa in tadahara alehi fa in allaha huwa maula huwa jibril wa salihul mu'mineen wal mala ika tu ba'da dalika zahir. Look what the Quran says. If you two, that means there are two wives being spoken of here in the conspiracy. This is Quran. I have not even named the wives yet. If you two turn in repentance to God, then indeed your hearts are inclined to this. But if you two back up each other against him, the Holy Prophet, then verily God it is who is his protector and Jibra'il and the most virtuous one amongst the believers and the angels thereafter will back him up. This is like two gangs coming against one another. This is war. The Quran has just announced war against two wives of the Prophet and the war involves God. The war, if we go back, look who's involved in this war. I wouldn't really want to mess about with this army. Verily, God is his protector. Gabriel, the most virtuous one amongst the believers and the angels. Now you imagine, what is it that you've done where all of a sudden the Quran tells the whole of Medina this it's not like God saying, you know what, this should be kept in house. No, 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 no. When you two wives have conspired against my prophet, peace be upon him and his family, there is no way that I'm not going to let the whole of Medina know about what you two are up to. Because the problem is sometimes people think we could do things and no one will find out, but we forget that God is the all-seeing, God is the all-knowing, God is the all-hearing. And if you mess about with the holy prophet, peace be upon him and his family, and you try to plot against the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, then get ready because you are waging a war. A war that could result in your divorce. Hold on, hold on, hold on. God doesn't like divorce. It's legal in Islam, but God doesn't like divorce. But in verse number 5 of Surah 66, God is now ready to say, you know what? Divorce could be on the cards for these two because of their behavior. Let's look at verse number five. What does the Quran say? Happily, his Lord, if he divorces you, my Lord. Happily, his Lord. Happily, his Lord, if he divorces you, will give him in your place wives better than you. What type of wives? Let's see what the Quran says. Muslimatin, mu'minatin. قَانِتَاتٍ تَائِبَاتٍ عَابِدَاتٍ سَائِحَاتٍ ثَيِّبَاتٍ وَأَبْكَارًا What type of wives will God give the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family? He will give, go back to it, submissive wives. He will give faithful wives. He will give obedient wives, repentant wives, prayerful wives, observers of fast, widows and virgins. I don't think there is a more fascinating intro to a chapter of the Holy Quran like Surah 66. Something's gone wrong in the house of the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, and that there are two ladies in his house who are conspiring against him. Someone might turn around and say, No, you don't understand. Said Ammar, listen, people are human, jealousy occurs. Well, if jealousy occurs, would the heavens get involved to say, uh, by the way, there's some jealousy in the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. We just want to announce to everyone in Medina, uh, the, the following two wives who will come to very shortly are the ones who are jealous of another wife. No, no, something is greater than this. 
And I need to understand what. But the problem is, if I look at Quran alone, I really don't know who it's referring to. I know the Quran is definitely talking about two wives because of verse number four saying, Tatuba ilallahi. So definitely it's two wives. But I want to understand which two wives, what's going on. And what's interesting is that Bukhari is very open on the discussion of this particular series of verses. Let's all go here to Sahih al Bukhari. Volume 8 of Sahih al-Bukhari. As you could all see, my dear brothers and sisters, volume 8 of Sahih al-Bukhari, the translation of the meanings of Sahih al-Bukhari, Arabic English, volume 8. A hadith 5970 to 6560, translated by Dr. Muhammad Muhsin Khan. Again, we will come over here because I want to make it clear how God exposes these two wives and their behaviors. Sahih al-Bukhari, Arabic English, Volume 8, translated by Dr. Muhammad Muhsin Khan. Dar es Salaam, Publishers and Distributors, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. If we come here in this particular chapter, we will see very clearly on the Book of Oaths and Vows, Hadith number 6691. Who is it narrated by? Aisha, as you could see. The Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, used to stay for a period in the house of Zainab bin Jahsh, one of the wives of the Prophet, and he used to drink honey in her house. Hafsa and I. Sorry, which book? Let me go back. Sahih al-Bukhari. Yep, let's go back. Hafsa, daughter of Umar ibn al-Khattab, and I, Aisha, daughter of Abi Bak, decided that when the Prophet entered upon either of us, she would say, I smell in you the bad smell of Maghafir. Can we all see this? A bad smelling raisin. Have you eaten maghafir, we would say? When he entered upon one of us, she said that to him. He replied to her, no, but I have drunk honey in the house of Zainab bin Jahsh. And I will never drink it again. Although honey, drinking honey is not forbidden. It's permissible. Remember what I said the first verse said? Drinking honey is not forbidden. All Muslims can drink honey. All Muslims can have a teaspoon of honey. All Muslims can have a drink which has honey inside it. So what's going on over here? We need to understand. I have drunk honey in the house of Zaynab Jash and I will never drink it again. Then the following verse was revealed. O oh Prophet, why do you forbid for yourself? That which Allah has allowed to you. Also his statement. Sahih al-Bukhari. Also his statement. If you two wives of the Prophet. Namely Aisha. Don't say Shia. Are the ones. Who. Talk about Aisha's personal life. Private life. Public life. They are against Aisha. I'm leaving Battle of Jamal for later. I don't even want to get to Jamal just now. I'm sticking here. I'm not even interested in the eye of the ifk because everyone keeps telling me the incident of the ifk is when the heavens cleared. I'm leaving the ifk. I'm leaving Jamal, my dear brothers and sisters. You could throw those on us every day, all day. I'm coming to Surah 66 because the heavens have decided that Aisha and Hafsa have to be spoken about publicly. Go back. If you two wives of the Prophet, namely Aisha and Hafsa, turn in repentance to Allah, 66.4, the two were Aisha and Hafsa, and also the statement of Allah Ta'ala, and remember when the Prophet disclosed the matter, in confidence to one of his wives, Hafsa, his saying, but I have drunk honey, Hisham said it also meant his saying, I will not drink anymore and I have taken an oath. So do not inform anybody of that. Can I please go back to the Quran so that all of you now, 
can at home very comfortably. I've got my own personal Quran and you guys could do it in your Quran as well. Everybody, when you go to Surah 66 of the Quran, all you have to write is next to verse number one, you could simply write over here, honey, and you can write here, maga, fear. Yes? Because we have what? Bukhari. We have volume eight of Bukhari. Aisha admitting that we were the ones who made fun of the smell of the mouth of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Something which, by the way, us who've never lived, never seen him, I don't think we'd ever do. And I think even you out there who are watching me, who is not Shia, ask yourself, you have the highest reverence for one who makes fun of the smell of the mouth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And you're the same person who if someone is fasting and their breath is not that good, you're saying, but you know what? At the end of the day, God loves the smell of the one who fasts. Here we have verse number one. I have put honey next to it, magafir next to it, Bukhari next to it. But then in verse number three, what have I done? Verse number three, I have written there, Hafsa. And I have written now Aisha because I want to complete the whole story. And then in verse number four, when it says, if you too in tetuba ilallahi, I'm going to put here Aisha and I'm going to put here Hafsa so that it clearly reminds me. And in verse number five, when it says about divorce and that God will happily see them both divorced. Again, I'm going to put Hafsa and here I'm going to put Aisha. And now I have what? Now... I as a Shi'i have used a Sunni piece of literature to prove the conspiracy. Wait, 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 sorry. Sorry. Someone said to me, the word conspiracy is too strong. I didn't really use that word. It was actually used by who? Let me go to this Mufassir of the Quran. People may have heard of him. Who should I go to? Well, over here, Sayyid Qutb. 20th century Mufassir of the Quran. In the shade of the Quran, we all know the book, Fi Dhalal al Quran, volume 17. All of you could see over here, Surah 62 to 77. Translated and edited by Adil Salahi, the Islamic Foundation, and IslamOnline.net. Join me over here. What do we have over here? Again, translated, Islamic Foundation, IslamOnline.net. What do we have here? Clearly, it is mentioned. That Mark for the Islamic Foundation, Markfield Commerce Center, Ruby Lane, Markfield, Leicester, LE67, 9SY. Is everybody very clear about all of this? Let me go to Sayyid Qutb and his explanation. When he comes to the tafsir of Surah 66 of the Holy Quran, look what he says over here. If we can zoom into this one line so that no one says, I am the one who's made the title conspirators conspiracy it seems look at this what it says in the reports first let's go up to the reports and then we'll come down the first paragraph there are several reports about the events in question one of which is related by al-bukhari which means that it is authentic on Aisha's authority, Al-Bukhari relates, the Prophet used to have a honey drink at Zainab and Jack's home and then stayed for some time with her. Hafsa and I secretly agreed that when he came to either of us, we would say to him, you have eaten maghafir, I can smell it. When this occurred, he said, no, I only had a honey drink at Zainab's. I will not do it again, and I have made an oath. Hence, verse number two of Surah 66 says you could withdraw such oaths that you have made. Let's go back to this effect. Do not tell anyone of this. This is what he prohibited for himself, even though it was permissible for him to have. Now go to paragraph number two. It seems that either Aisha or Hafsa told her co-conspirator of the Prophet's decision to no longer take this honey drink. Sayyid Qutb does not backtrack or sugarcoat. Co-conspirator. Why, Sayyid Qutb, do you have to say co-conspirator? For what reason are you using the word conspiracy, which alludes to the word plot, 
from those who are meant to be the most beloved to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. People always ask me as Shia, you people, you, is it true you don't respect the wives? No, 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 no. I have a league table for the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi with all due respect. Number one, and a country mile ahead. Premiership winner, Champions League winner, World Cup winner, UEFA Cup winner, European Cup winner, whatever winner, Khadija al Kubra, salawatullah wa salamu alayha. That's miles ahead. And I respect, of course, after her, Um Salama, with the utmost respect. And then the rest all come in their different orders. Those who fought Muslims cannot be equated with those who built Islam. Those who fought the Khalifa of their time cannot be equated with those who helped the Prophet of their time. I have a reverence in which respect they are like my mothers, that none of us can marry them after they've married Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and that there are some who are on a much higher level than others. There is no way that I will put Um Habiba on the same level as Um Salama. There is no chance because I see that their behaviors and actions differ from one to the other. So now when I come back here, Sayyid Qutb, what does he say? He continues by saying, he, God then informed him of the same. This is very interesting, by the way. He went back to her and mentioned some of what went on between the two of them, but without recounting it all in order not to embarrass her. He only touched upon the subject so that she realized that he was aware of it all. Surprised, she asked him, this is a huge moment when it comes to Iman I ask you if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, if the holy prophet peace be upon him tells you that I know you did this I'm only going to reveal parts of what you've done but I know you've done this would you ever ask him who told you think about it I pause for a reason would you ask the man who up till this verse was revealed has been receiving revelation from the heavens about things that he wasn't even present at? He is told about the way this universe was created. He is told about the Adamic and the Satanic story in that Garden of Eden. He is told about the story of the flood of Noah. He is told of the story of Abraham and those idol worshippers, Moses and the children of Israel, David and Solomon, Abraham with his sons Ishmael and Isaac. He is told of the details of the virgin birth, but also the ascension to the heavens. He is told of even prophets from Idris towards Shu'ib, from Zechariah towards Yahya. He is told about the embryo and the zygote and the wombs. And all the animals, those we can see and those we can't see. Is that someone you ask a question about his Wi-Fi and how strong it is to the heavens? But right here, when we go to it, my dear brother and sister, surprise, she asked him, who told you all of this? It might have occurred to her that his other wife was the one to tell him. He, however, said to her, the all-knowing, the all-aware told me. His information then was given by the one who knows it all. Sayyid Qutb, Ya Habibna, you think that we don't know his information was given it by God? But you, Sayyid Qutb, in the 20th century, you know that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has access to the heavens whenever he needs any information. And the wife who lives with him does not know that the Heavens are in communication with him. How could someone ask the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, having already made fun of his breath, having already divulged the secret which he did not want anyone to know about? Now there is here in this moment also another opinion that is given. And that is that some have also said that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, was with his wife Mary the Coptic, or with another wife by the name of Sauda. If I go to Suyuti's Asbab al Nuzul, let me go to Suyuti's Asbab al Nuzul. One of the best works on uh, Asbab al Nuzul is the work of Suyuti. Uh, many of you would have heard of it over here. Lubab al Nuqul fi Asbab al Nuzul lil Hafiz Jalal al Din Abdul Rahman. We all know him. Ibn Abi Bakr Suyuti. Okay, here we have Dar al Salal 
عالمية. All of you would have come across this. Suyuti actually discusses this in his text, which is a famous text that tries to look at why certain incidents happen. What is the reason for revelation? The whole text is the reason for revelation. And what Suyuti does is when he comes to here, all of you could see, Surah Al-Tahrim over here. Okay. And we come to Hadith 1047. And Sahih. And Ibn Abbas قال كان رسول الله يشرب what? عند سودة العسل. رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله used to drink honey in the house of soda. One of his wives. Okay. فيدخل على عائشة فقالت إني أجد منك ريحا ثم دخل على حفصة فقالت مثل ذلك فقال أراه من شراب شربته عن عند سودة والله لا أشربه. Okay. He said that this was a drink that I would drink with soda. By Allah, I will not drink it. فنزلت يا أيها النبي لما تحرم ما حل الله لك. Here we see. وله شاهد في الصحيحين. قال الحافظ ابن حجر يحتمل أن تكون الآية نزلت في السببين معا. Interesting here that we have Suyuti saying that it was soda who the Prophet would spend time with. And when the Prophet is spending time with soda, this honey drink incident comes back. There's a third opinion, by the way, which emerges as well. I've got over here Tafsir al Jalalain. Tafsir al Jalalain, Jalal al Din al Mahalli, and Jalal al Din al Suyuti. All of you could see Tafsir al Jalalain. Tafsir al Jalal al Din al Mahalli, Jalal al Din al Suyuti, another of the Tafasir. So today we've had. Uh, the tafsir of Qutb, and we've had the tafsir of Suyuti on Asbab al Nusul, and we have tafsir al Jalalain, Jalal al Din al Mahalli, and Jalal al Din al Suyuti. So Suyuti is very much part and parcel. Here we have the publisher of the inspiring book, Tafsir al Jalalain, is deeply grateful to Professor Jibril Aminu for his generosity in making the publication of the book possible. May Allah bless all those who fund the Islamic works. His contribution is greatly valued as it enables the book to reach a wider readership. May Allah accept his deeds and grant him. Paradise. And here we have what? Translation Aisha Buli, editor Abdul Haq Buli and Muhammad Isa Wali, published by Dar al Taqwa, 7A Malcolm Street, Baker Street, London, NW16AE. I just want to try and get to where? Let's try and get to Surah Al Tahreem. When we get to Surah Al Tahreem, we see that they give their explanation of Surah Al Tahreem. And it's very interesting. They're very open about everything. But here they just give a different sabab in nuzul But again, very similar. This idea that the Prophet has done something where his wives Hafsa and Aisha cannot take this. This is Tafsir al-Jalalain. Let's see. We go to verse number one. Oh Prophet, why do you make unlawful what Allah has made lawful for you? This has to do with his slave girl, Maria al-Qubtiya, Mary the Coptic. When he slept with her in the house of Hafsa, who was absent. When Hafsa came back unexpectedly, it was hard for her that this had happened in her house and on her bed. <sighs> Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi behaving like this, I'm not sure to tell you the honest truth. But then again, you know, if you're studying some of the works of Sunni literature from Bukhari, from Muslim, his private life, I don't know, it exposes everything possible and some things just don't seem logical. Anyway, let's go back. The Prophet then said, she is haram for me, seeking by doing this to please your wives. Meaning the Prophet knew that Hafsa was unhappy. And so he said, you know what, I won't go near Maria again. Allah is ever forgiving. And forgives you making this unlawful for yourself. God intervened and was like, no, 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 no. You continue being with whoever you want to be. There is no way that Hafsa or Aisha can do anything to stop you doing what you want. Go to verse number three. Remember when the prophet, verse number three, please. Remember when the prophet, verse number three. Remember when the prophet confided a certain matter. Meaning the making unlawful of Maria to one of his wives, Hafsa, and he told her, do not divulge it. Listen, Hafsa, if this is if this is Sabab in Nazul, and I don't agree with this Sabab, but anyway, Hafsa, don't tell anyone that I was with my wife Maria. Okay? If this is the secret, mind you, there is another tafsir where people are still 
questioning what is the secret that's so big that Hafsa had to go to Aisha to tell her. Anyway, we'll come back to that later. Now, meaning the making unlawful of Maria to one of his wives, Hafsa, and he told her, don't divulge it. Listen, I could tell my missus something, and I tell her, listen, don't tell anyone, and she could keep it a secret forever. But here, the wife of the Prophet seemingly cannot. Then when she divulged it to Aisha, thinking that there was no harm in doing so, Allah disclosed that to him, and he communicated part of it to Hafsa. So the Prophet told part of what she had done to Hafsa, and withheld part of it out of generosity on his part. I don't want to, um, I don't know, stamp the foot too hard or like, you know, destroy you in one second by everything. So I won't say everything. The soft heartedness, the akhlaq of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Then when he came here, when he told her of it, she said, who told you of this? Wi-Fi, heaven, Gabriel, wings, good connection. He said, the all-knowing and all-aware informed me of it. Verse number four. If the two of you, Aisha and Hafsa, would only turn to Allah, for your hearts clearly deviated. Allahu Akbar. Wallah. If a Shi'i on a pulpit said that the hearts of Aisha and Hafsa deviated, Wallah, you will have TikTok on fire till Qiyamah. And you will say the Shia are the worst. They are the worst of the earth. They are scum, rawafid, mushrik, polytheist. Oh, yeah. My Lord Almighty. Wallah, here's a tafsir of renown. Sunni ulama. Look what they're saying. If the two of you, Aisha and Hafsa, would only turn to Allah. Yes. For your hearts clearly deviated. Because they wanted to make Maria unlawful and were happy about that, although the Prophet disliked it. That was a wrong action. The plural hearts is used instead of two hearts because the plural has greater weight. But if you support one another, Allahu Akbar, if you two, Aisha and Hafsa, the possibility was there. The heavens made it clear that Aisha and Hafsa, within their character, had the possibility of opposing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. One may argue it was proved on the day of Jamal that even the son-in-law got opposed. If you support one another against him, the Prophet may Allah bless him and grant him peace in what he dislikes. Allah is his protector. You mess with my Prophet if you dare wage war against my Prophet. If you dare plot against my Prophet, I, my brothers and sisters, now this is, my reading and who am I? But my reading, I don't even think, I don't even think the secret was anything to do with honey drinks. I don't even know. I think honey drink was about verse number one. Verse number three, I think there's issues there. The heavens have intervened. Some secret has been told to Hafsa, which is a big secret. And she's gone and divulged to Aisha. Hafsa, daughter of Umar ibn al-Khattab, divulges a secret to Aisha, daughter of Abi Bakr. Quran doesn't say what the secret is. In the order of the Khulafa, Aisha's father's first, Hafsa's father's second. In the order of the Khulafa. The two main voices in Saqifa were Aisha and Hafsa's fathers. Umar gave a pledge of allegiance to Abi Bakr. And the daughters were divulging secrets to one another before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi died. Let's go back. Particularly, Allah is his protector. And so are Jibreel and every right acting man of the believers, particularly Aisha and Hafsa's fathers, Abu Bakr and Umar, may Allah be pleased with them. And furthermore, the angels too will come to his support against the two wives who allowed you, Suyuti, to say, that the righteous of the believers who support Allah and his prophet is Abu Bakr and Umar. You know what I find very interesting? Is that you can just literally slot in names of whoever you want in these situations. Whatever this secret is, verse number five, it may be that if he divorces you, this is not my tafsir, this is Suyuti and Mahalli. It may be that if he does divorce you, referring to the Prophet divorcing his wives, his Lord will give him in exchange better wives than you. 
the exchange did not happen because he didn't divorce them. He has to stick that in. The exchange didn't happen because he did not divorce them. Tell me, when Allah says divorce is a possibility, is it for something like the curry didn't taste nice? The rice was off? The salad could have tasted better? Or is it something much greater than that? Muslim woman, believing woman, obedient woman, penitent woman, woman who will worship, woman who fasts much, previously married woman, as well as virgins. You know what's unbelievable here? Aisha and Hafsa are exposed in the middle of Medina society in a society that had thought that the heavens had let Aisha off with the incident of the ifk. Allah came back to slander again? Everyone says, with the incident of the ifk and the, and the accusation of adultery, the heavens said no chance. But then why, O oh Allah, do you expose Aisha again? Why, O oh Allah, constantly, or is there a contradiction? One minute you let her off something, another minute you make her actions public to the extent that you announce to Medina these two wives can be divorced. Let's go to Sahih al-Bukhari and see Omar's discussion and commentary on what exactly took place over here. Umar ibn al-Khattab, father of Hafsa, in this very arguably one of the longest hadiths that you will find within Sahih al-Bukhari, there is this hadith here. This is one of the longest hadiths I've ever come across in Sahih al-Bukhari. All of you can see here, Sahih al-Bukhari, the translation of the meaning of Sahih al-Bukhari. Arabic English, volume 3 now. A hadith 177 to 2337, translated by Dr. Muhammad Muhsin. Khan, the translation of the meanings of Sahih al-Bukhari, Arabic English, volume 3, Dr. Muhammad Muhsin Khan. Let me come here. The book of what? Of the Madhalim, Kitab al-Madhalim. Hadith number what? If we can zoom in to hadith number 2468, narrated Ibn Abbas radiallahu anh. I had been eager to ask Umar about the two ladies from amongst the wives of the Prophet. Regarding whom Allah said in the Quran, if you two wives of the Prophet, namely Aisha and Hafsa, turn in repentance to Allah, it will be better for you. Your hearts are indeed inclined to oppose what the Prophet likes. Till I perform the Hajj along with Umar. Ibn Abbas performs the Hajj now alongside Umar. Now he wants to ask him. And on our way back from Hajj, he went aside to answer the call of nature. And I also went aside along with him carrying a tumbler of water. When he ans had answered the call of nature and returned, I poured water on his hands from the tumbler and he performed ablution. I said, O chief of the believers, who were the two ladies from amongst the wives of the Prophet to whom Allah Azza wa Jal said, if you two wives of the Prophet, namely Aisha and Hafsa, turn and to Allah, it will be better for you. Your hearts are indeed inclined. He said, I am astonished at your question, O Ibn Abbas. They were Aisha and Hafsa. Then Umar went on relating the narration and said, I and an Ansari neighbor of mine from Bani Umay bin Zaid, who used to live where? We used to live in the Awali of Medina. Yes, Awali al-Medina. Used to visit the Holy Prophet in turns. He used to go one day and I another day. When I went, I would bring him the news of what had happened that day regarding the instructions and orders. And when he went, he used to do the same for me. We, the people of Quraysh, used to have authority over women. But when we came to live with the Ansar, we noticed that the Ansari woman had the upper hand over their men. So our woman started acquiring the habits of the Ansari woman. We go over here. Once I shouted at my wife, Omar says, and she shouted back at me in return, and I disliked that she should answer me back. She said, why do you take it ill that I retort upon you? By Allah, the wives of the Prophet retort upon him, and some of them may not speak with him for the whole day till night. Omar says, what she said scared me, and I said to her, whoever amongst them does so will be a great loser. Then I dressed myself, and went to Hafsa and asked her, Does any of you keep Allah's messenger angry 
all the day long till night? She replied in the affirmative. Does any of you keep Rasulullah angry? She replied, yes. Let's go back. I said, she is a ruined, losing person and will never have success. Of course, if a Shi'i said that, we wouldn't hear the end of this until Qiyamah. Let's go back. Doesn't she fear that Allah may get angry for the anger of Allah's messenger? And thus she will be ruined? Notice how Omar makes clear. Allah gets angry for the anger of Allah's messenger and thus she will be ruined. We'll look at the incident of Fedek soon inshallah. Don't ask Allah's messenger too many things and don't retort upon him in any case. Don't reply to him in any case and don't desert him. Demand from me whatever you like and don't be tempted to imitate your neighbor Aisha in her behavior towards Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, for she Aisha is more beautiful than you and more beloved to Allah's messenger. That means there is a pecking order in the wives of Rasulullah. So my league table has a very clear logical point. Let's go back. In those days, it was rumored that what? In those days, it was rumored that Ghassan, a tribe living in Sham, were getting prepared their horses to invade us. My companion went to the Prophet on the day of his turn, went and returned to us at night and knocked at my door violent, violently, asking whether I was sleeping. I was scared by the hard knocking and came out to him. He said that a great thing had happened. I asked him, what is it? Have Ghassan come? He replied that it was worse and more serious than that. And added that Allah's messenger had divorced all his wives. I said Hafsa is a ruined loser. Look in the Arabic. I expected that it would happen someday. So I dressed myself and offered the Fajr prayer with the Prophet, peace be upon his family. Then the Prophet, peace be upon his family, entered an upper room and stayed there alone. Ya Allah. Ya Allah, how they hurt Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Ya Allah, how they angered Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. No wonder, Ya Allah, that you interfered by putting a verse in the Quran about their behavior. Let's go back. I went to Hafsa and found her weeping. I asked her, why are you weeping? Didn't I warn you? Have Allah's messenger divorced you all? She replied, I don't know. He is there in the upper room. I then went out and came to the pulpit and found a group of people around it. And some of them were weeping. Then I sat with them for some time but could not endure the situation. So I went to the upper room where the prophet was. And requested to a black slave of his, will you get the permission of Allah's messenger for Umar to enter? The slave went in, talked to the prophet about it and came out saying, I mentioned you to him, but he did not reply. So I went and sat with the people who were sitting by the pulpit, but I could not bear the situation. So I went to the slave again and said, will you get the permission for Umar? He went in and brought the same reply as before. When I was leaving, behold, the slave called me saying, Allah's messenger has granted you permission. My dear brothers and sisters, I will continue tomorrow night to see when Umar ibn al-Khattab begins to confront and discuss with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, the behavior of his daughter Hafsa and Abu Bakr's daughter Aisha. And let's see how the Prophet replies and how the other hadiths indicate the troublesome nature and the conspiracies that took place around the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And tomorrow we'll continue by looking at, at the same time, the end of Surah Al-Tahreem and how God talks about other wives of the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. I look forward to part two of this discussion of the conspiracy of Aisha and Hafsa. Join me tomorrow. Sahih al-Bukhari, Kitab al-Madalim. We'll continue to analyze further. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Welcome to Morning Baraka Ramadan special with me, Ali Fadl. Assalamu alaikum, dear viewers. Assalamu alaikum, Abu Amir. And now we head back to the IHTV studios with Yunus with the latest news brought to you by Shia Waves. It's a beautiful start to the day as many around the world celebrate the auspicious birth of Imam al Hassan al Mujtaba alayhi salam across the world on the 15th of Ramadan. And coming up on today's episode of Morning Baraka, we have a special guest, Abbas. The naan is burning. Many Muslims think that all fish are allowed. No, only fish with scales are allowed. I mean, of course, this is according to most of our maraja. Please do go back to your marja to double check. Today, I'm outside Al Rasul Adam Center right here in North London as we see how they prepare for the holy nights of Al Qadr. Come join us on Haida on the 19th of Ramadan. In this morning Barakah Ramadan special, we are dedicating a whole segment specifically for the Holy Quran. And actually, Abbas, I'd rethink touching the Holy Quran without wudu. Because the Prophet actually mentioned when it comes to the holy verses of Allah, the Quran. In December 2023, I met a young boy called Amir. I also met his younger brother Hussein. I didn't meet his mother because his mother had passed away in September 2022, a year and three months before. I want to live the life of an orphan. I've come to see Emir and his younger brother. I want to follow what happens in their day. He told me an insight from an orphan in Karbala. Knife crime and drug misuse is very much open. And then what we'll do, essentially, I want them to come to live a day in the life of a Zair. All of the people that live in these situations, there is no hope for them. However, with Amir, I saw hope and I'll explain why. As lovers of the Ahlul Bayt, we all have an inclination to the epitome of love. When we rejoice, when times are hard, whatever stage of life we are in, we all yearn to be in one special place. We all wish to visit the Blessed Shrine of Imam Al Hussein in the holy city of Karbala. Not all of us have the blessing to visit the shrine of Imam Hussein, but there is still a way to experience the sights and sound of the blessed land of Karbala in the comfort of your own homes. We call upon you, dear viewers, to support us in our financial costs to help bring the Holy Land of Karbala beaming into your homes. You can support us with a monthly donation of just 50 US dollars or 30 pounds. We are your gateway to Karbala. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Imam Hussein TV3. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم I'm a 
لم يعلم كلا إن الإنسان لا يطغى إن إلى ربك رجع أرأيت الذي ينهى عبدا إذا صلى أرأيت إن كان على الهدى أو أمر بالتقوى صدق الله العلي العظيم أم يتصل؟ نايس السلام عليكم My name is Mohsin Shah My name is Abu Talib We would like to say thank you to all the viewers and all those who have been supporting the ATAM here in Karbala whether it's to do with health, 